Amen. Well, Expansion Church, it is good to see your face back in the place to be. Come on, there's no place like this place anywhere around this place. Amen. Amen. If you'll remember, if you were here last week, we started off a brand new series called Reach. And Reach, right, right away, I think we kicked that thing off with a bang in Jesus' name. Reach was all about us reaching out to those that are in our lives, whether it be the people at the grocery store, the person in the cubicle next to you at work, whether it be the neighbor that you have. It's all about us reaching out to those people that we encounter on a day in and day out basis that are far from God. In fact, last week, I told you that Matthew chapter 28 was called, is known as the Great Commission. Uh, Jesus says in the Great Commission, I read it to you in the Message Bible, he says that I have been commanded and authorized by God to commission you. Who is the you? All of us. To go into the world making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Here's the thing that I love about Jesus. He didn't leave a whole lot of room for options in that thing. He didn't leave much room for suggestions. There's no way you could come out of that reading that text saying that this is maybe just a suggestion. Maybe this is something that I should do. No, 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 no. Jesus made it super clear that as a believer in him, a believer in Jesus Christ, it is essential to our faith that we reach those that are far from him and help draw them closer to him. I shared a story with you last week. If you didn't catch the whole story, you need to go back on YouTube, everybody. YouTube, YouTube. You need to watch this thing. You need to watch this, this, uh, this story. But anyways, I went with a group of friends of mine, uh, my, myself and a group of friends. We went down fishing in Key West. Uh, we had this great idea. Let's jump off of the bridge and swim back to shore. Uh, we realized very early on that we had made a bad mistake. Uh, we almost drowned. But praise God, he sent us a boat. This man came with a life raft. He tied the rope to the life raft, and he pulled me and my friends back into shore one by one. One of the things that I shared with you that was that while we needed a physical rescue that day, there are people all around you every day that are in need of a spiritual rescue. I mean, they're crying out for help. They are in desperate need of a spiritual rescue. And I think it's amazing that the creator of the universe would want to partner with us for us to make the introduction. You see, because if we don't make the introduction, there are a lot of people in our life that are drowning that are going to drown. If you and I aren't willing to make the introduction, I don't know about you, but that humbles me to think that God would want to use me to help make the introduction between lost people and himself. So last week was all about reaching out, throwing a life raft to those that are in need of one. But you might be saying to yourself, okay, pastor, I reach out to people that are lost. Well, what do I do next? And so today, I want to talk about what's the next step. What do you do after you've identified the family member, the neighbor, the friend, the person at the gas station that is lost? What do you do next? The next thing you got to do is relate. In fact, write this down. After you reach out, you then must relate Here's the thing, it does not matter whether or not you identify a lost person if you're not willing to build a relationship with that person. Come on, y'all, 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 maybe, maybe you're old enough to remember Christian tracks. Come on, anybody remember tracks here? Yeah, yeah, people would pass out these tracks, and the tracks for many people were like, okay, I don't have to do the work, the tracks will do all the work. But the reality is that that is not as effective of an uh, an evangelism tool as you building a relationship with somebody who's far from God and helping to make the introduction. Come on, somebody. And so we've got to be able to relate. You know, the Apostle Paul says it like this. He talks all about what it is like to relate to a person in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. This is what he says. He says, even though I am a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people to bring many to Christ. In other words, Paul says, if I'm going to be bound to anything in this life, it's going to be to winning over lost people for Jesus. 
right? I'm not going to be bound to the things of this world. I'm not going to be bound to alcohol. I'm not going to be bound to drugs. I'm not going to be bound to shame and to guilt and all these other addictions that we find ourselves in. He says, if I'm going to be bound to anything, I'm going to be bound to bringing lost people closer to their father. Come on, somebody. Let that be said of each and every one of us. We're not going to be bound to the things of this world. We're going to be bound to things that come with an eternal reward. Look at what he says in verse number 20. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew. I, 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 uh, to bring Jews to Christ. When I was with those who followed Jewish law, I too lived under the law. Even though I am not subject to the law, I did this so that I could bring to Christ those who were under the law. Verse 21. When I am with the Gentiles who do not follow Jewish law, I too live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. But I do not ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. When I am with those who are weak, I share in their weaknesses. For I want to bring the weak to Christ. Yes, just in case you're wondering, Paul says, I try to find common ground with everybody, doing everything I can to save some. Verse 23, I do everything to spread the good news and share in his blessings. Come on, somebody. The first thing I want you to write down is this. I, if I'm going to reach those that are far from Christ, I'm going to have to learn to relate to those that are far from Christ. If I'm going to reach people that are far from Christ, i got to get to a point where I'm able to build relationships with people that are far from Christ. This is not rocket science. If you cannot relate to people, it is very difficult for you to tell them about the God you serve. You, you, you got to be able to first connect with people. I think this is one of the biggest issues that we have in the body of Christ because we're in a place where we don't want to spend the energy it takes to relate to people. It's just much easier for us to post a couple of, uh, of, of, of uh, uh, words on social media. That's easier. It doesn't take any work. It doesn't take any intel. Um, um, goodness gracious. Intentionality. <laughs> I'm stumbling on my words today. It doesn't take any work. It doesn't take any intentionality. It doesn't take any energy. It's easier just to post it in a couple of characters on social, me on social media. There's so many of us, we don't want to relate to people because we don't have time for that. We're busy. We got a lot going on. It's easier for us just to say, hey, you don't vote the way I vote. You, you just go to hell then. You go to hell because you don't, you don't believe what I believe. So you just, you just go to hell. That's, that's easier. We, we say, well, well I don't want to relate to other people. It's easier for me just to help them change their behavior. So I'm all about behavior modification. If I could just fix their behavior, then everything will be okay. What good is it if I help you change your behavior and you go to hell anyways? I, I mean, I want you to think about this for a minute. We do not follow God because of behavior. We follow God because we've made a decision to surrender ourselves to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. There's so many people who've said, well, I don't believe in Jesus, but I walk upright. I do everything right. Who, what does it matter if you do everything right, but you never surrender your heart to the King? Paul says this when he talks about relating to people. He, he says, I become all things to all people. If we're serious about reaching people that are far from God, we've got to be willing to become all things to all people. One thing that Paul recognized was this. Effective evangelism begins with relationship. Effective evangelism begins with relationship. So often we're like, well, I just need to go and tell them that they need to change their lives. But if you're not focused on building a relationship with them, they don't want to hear anything you have to say. Effective evangelism begins with relationship. So here's what I want to do today. Today, I want to give you some practical things that you and I can put in place so that we can more effectively reach the people in our life that are far from God, okay? I, I need y'all to talk back, okay? Y'all came in here kind of quiet this morning. I need y'all to talk back. Some of y'all are looking at me with a dead face. I need you to wake up, amen? Amen. Look at your neighbor. Look at your neighbor. I want you to look at him. Look at him. Look at him deep in their soul. And I want you to tell him that you better wake up. You better wake up, okay? All right. 
the first thing we got to do is we got to meet people where they're at. We've got to meet people where they're at. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22. Paul says, yes, I try to find common ground with everyone. Paul was all about finding common ground. In other words, you've got to look for common ground. Ground. If you're going to reach people that are far from God, you're going to have to look for common ground. So many in our society, we choose not to look for common ground. In other words, the things that we can agree upon, the ways that we're alike, because it's a whole lot easier to focus on how we're different. In fact, let me just say this. People do not drift towards common ground. They drift towards division. It takes intentionality to get to a place of common ground. You got to work in order to find common ground. I tell you all the time, I spent years going into a maximum security prison, not too far from here, 1,500 brothers that are locked up behind bars, many of whom are going to spend the rest of their lives behind bars. Uh, just like any group, if you put human beings in a, uh, a place all together, eventually they will begin to sort. And you'll begin to figure out who the leaders are. In fact, if we were locked in this room uh, for the next month, praise God, uh, we would begin to sort. And we begin to figure out who the leaders are in this room. Well, the same thing happens in prison. The thing in prison is that the leaders are the gang leaders, right? And so you've got the gang leaders of the Bloods and the Crips and the Gangster Disciples and the MS-13 and the Aryan Nation. All of these gangs, the leaders of these gangs, are the ones that call all the shots in the prisons. They're they're the big fish. They're, They're the ones that all of the other inmates fear. And so I had the blessing of being able to go in and spend some time with those brothers. And I'm not being facetious. I actually believe it was a blessing. And so I got to the prison one day, and they escorted me back to a room. It was a small classroom, and there were 17 of these brothers uh, representing each one of the gangs that called the shots in this prison. And so they took me in the room, and then they closed the door. And I was like, okay, this is a mistake, okay? Uh, Like, uh, uh, I think, uh, you want to talk about scared, okay? I was scared, y'all. Okay, I don't think I've ever stood that close to a door before in my life. Okay, the whole time I was teaching them, I had one hand on the doorknob just in case, just in case things gonna go where I want them to go. I got my hand on the doorknob. They gave us these little pages, and the pages had a button on them. And they said, if anything ever goes wrong, just press the button and we'll come running. This thing looked like it was about a hundred years old. I didn't even, I was like, there's no way this button actually works on this thing. So as I'm teaching, I got one hand on the doorknob, I got another hand on the button. And I'm like, just in case y'all decide to get crazy, okay? Here I am, 17 guys that on the surface don't look like we have anything in common. I, I've never been in a gang before. Uh, I, I've never sold drugs before. I've Uh, I've never been locked up behind bars before. Uh, Every night I go home to my wife and to my kids. On surface, it might look like we have nothing in common. However, just like the Apostle Paul said, I had to find common ground. Which, by the way, if I have to find it, that means it's going to take action and work. Common ground is not going to just come. You have to actually go and work to find the common ground. Are you with me on that? So I had to find common ground. So I came in to teach leadership lessons from Jesus, okay? These brothers initially, they just kind of stared at me, kind of like how some of y'all are staring at me today, okay? They just kind of stared at me with with their arms folded. But I had to find the common ground, and what I realized was the common ground was that all of them had kids, right? And here's what I know about people. People love talking about their kids, And it doesn't matter whether or not there's distance between you and your kids. Maybe in these guys' cases, some of them haven't talked to their kids in 5, 10, 15 years. But at the end of the day, that's still their baby. And no matter what they do, no matter how long they stay locked up behind bars, that's still their baby. And so I found the common ground. I started talking to these brothers about their kids. And what I realized was that in many ways, they're just like me. Like, they have a desire 
to want to have a relationship with their kids in the same way I have a desire to want to have a relationship with my kids. In fact, one of the things that I found out was that they would actually do crimes inside the prison so they could make money outside the prison so that they could send the money to their kids. And you might be saying to yourself, how do they pull that off? I don't know. It was a real complex operation, okay? A real complex operation, okay? But the point of the matter is that they desired the same thing I desired. One of the things you'll find when it comes to people is that you have way more in common with people than you think you do. It just might take a little bit of time for you to find what you have in common with them. But you got way more in common with people than you think you do. Here's one thing that ended up happening. We ended up in a place where within one hour, I had established so much common ground with these brothers that they were asking me, how do they get out of a gang? And I was like, I don't know. I don't know. I think you should just, I don't know, maybe put in your letter of resignation. I don't know. I don't know. Like, I don't know how that works. I don't know. But this is what, this is what happened. This is why. This is why they asked that. What happened was we had built, I had built trust with them. Because here's the thing about trust. If you're willing to spend time relating to people, trust will be built. Taking the time to relate to people helps build trust. They knew after an hour that I had their best interest at heart. By the way, a lot of gang members, I found out, do not want to be gang members. The problem is if they decide not to be a gang member, their fear is that they will not make it in the prison system. It's the same thing on the streets. If they do not become a gang member, their fear is that I won't survive on the streets if I'm not a gang member. So many in our society, we look at them with disgust, but you don't actually understand their story, which is why you got to take time to build relationship, because it's in the relationship that you'll begin to understand. Now, does that make it right? No, it doesn't make it right. But remember, I'm not looking for where we're different. I'm looking at where we're alike. Are you with me on that? I think that so many of us, we have the wrong starting point, right? Like we approach it the wrong way. If, we, if you start wrong, then you're going to end wrong. I wanted to give you an example of how I start and how I think you should start. If you're going to connect with people, if you're going to build relationships with people so that you can tell them about Jesus, write this down. You've got to take an interest in what they're interested in. Take an interest in what they're interested in. Now, listen, I'm not good at a whole lot of things, but I am great at this, okay? Here's what I've learned about people. People love to talk about themselves. And if you let people talk about themselves, they will think you are the most incredible person on the planet. So I take an interest in whatever people are interested in, even if I'm not interested in it. You want to talk about gum? Let's talk about gum. You want to talk about trees? I love trees. You want to talk about wood? <laughs> I love wood. You want to talk about planes? Let's talk about planes. You want to talk about flooring? I love flooring. I got some at my house. You want to talk about walls? Oh, walls. Goodness, I love walls, right? I will take an interest in anything someone else is interested in. Why? Because it's not about me. It's not about me. I'm willing to do anything it takes to help build the relationship so I can tell somebody about the God I serve. But if you're not willing to take that step, why would they want to hear about your God? Why? If you're only willing to take an interest in other people for your own interest, by the way, people know when you're doing that. If you're only willing to take an interest in other people for your own interest, I would say you probably have a selfishness problem. It's not about you. It's about what God is trying to do through you. I went, I had an opportunity to go to a fundraising event up in South Carolina last year, and uh, there were people with a lot of means, a lot of means, a lot of means, a lot of green, a lot of means, a lot of green, a lot of means at this fundraising event. And uh, I don't know, if you've ever been around people with a lot of means, um, you kind of start to walk upright, you know, like, you know, your, body, your back gets a little straight, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, you walk different, you know, when you got to get around people with a lot of means. My, my English got better. <laughs> you know, some of y'all, <laughs> some of y'all black folk leave letters off the end of the word, okay? I pronounce every letter. 
And so here I am at this event, and I met a father-son duo, uh, Jack and Bo. Jack and Bo are uh, second and third generation oil men, right? They pump oil out of the ground. That's their business. That's what they do. Now, you ain't got to be a rocket scientist to know that if you pump oil out of the ground, you got some green, okay? <laughs> because we keep giving them the money every time we go to the gas uh, pump. We, give, we keep giving them our money, okay? So here, I'm st I start building a relationship. Now, on the surface, I have nothing in common with these brothers, okay? Like zero, okay? What I realized was they wanted to talk about oil derivatives and fracking. I don't care about oil derivatives and fracking, but I had a whole lot of fracking conversation. Fracking, frick, fracking, 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 fracking. We had a lot of conversation about this stuff. We ended up building such a great relationship that I've had the opportunity to go to Texas and, and hang out with them. And they, they invited us to a ranch that they own out in Austin, Texas. It's just been great getting to know these guys, but that would have never happened if I was not willing to take an interest in what they were interested in. Paul says it like this in verse 20, when I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew. If Paul was hanging out with the Jews, he took an interest in what Jewish people were interested in. Oh, well, I don't know if I'm willing to take an interest in what other people, what do they think I'm fake and phony? No, 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 no. Paul says, I'm so invested in winning people for Christ that I'm going to take an interest in whatever they're interested in. You want to talk about Jewish, what it means to be Jewish? Let's talk. Paul says this in verse 21, when I'm with the Gentiles who do not follow the Jewish law, I too live apart from the law. Yeah, we don't do this whole law thing. We don't do this Jewish law thing. We don't do this thing. We don't do this thing. He was willing to talk about whatever interested them because it wasn't about him. It was about reaching them for Christ. Now, maybe you're saying to yourself, that just comes across as fake and phony. I'm like being a chameleon. I'm over here on one person. I'm over here on another person. Here's what you got to understand, and that I think Paul understood. While the message should never change, the methods are going to constantly change. Okay, Paul. Paul's message was the same when he was with the Jews. The message was the same when he was with the Gentiles. The message was with the same when he was with those that were weak. That didn't change. The message was all about Christ. He talked about Christ with whatever group he was with. But what changed was his approach. In other words, I'm not going to have the conversation the same way with an oil man that I'm going to have with somebody locked up behind bars in prison. Why? In the secular world, we say things like, you got to know your audience. You got to know who you're talking to. And you got to be willing to take interest in what interests them. I'm not, you call it fake and phony. At the end of the day, when I get to heaven, all I'm looking for is a well done. Because I want a line full of people behind me walking in with me. I don't care what you think about fake and phony. So that's the first thing, the first thing that we have to do. The first thing we got to do is we got to look for common ground. We got to meet people where they're at. The second thing that we've got to do is we've got to love them as they are. <gasps> what a novel idea. We've got to love people as they are. Look at this quote. We should try to reach people where they are today and expect to see changes later. The problem is, so many of us, we want to see changes right now. Like, we want to see their behavior change right now. That's why we're so in the fix-it mode. Got to fix them, got to fix them, got to fix them. Which, by the way, people don't want to be fixed. Especially by you or me. Nobody wants to be fixed. Everybody, every human being wants to be loved for who they are. Despite their flaws, despite their issues, despite their struggles, people want to be loved as they are. If you approach the relationship from the perspective of let me fix you, they will turn around and run like the wind. Look at what this, look at what this says. You can't relate to someone and try to fix them at the same time. You can't relate to someone and try to fix them at the same time. You got to decide which one do you want. Do you want to fix them or do you want to build a relationship with them? You can't have both. You got to make a decision which one you want. By the way, people know when they're smart. They know when you just want to fix them. 
I remember we would go into the prison and some of the guys would come in with the fix-it mentality. I'm going to go into the prisons. I'm going to fix these guys. No, you're not. By the way, it's not our job to fix people. That's what God does. I told y'all last week. I think I said this last week. If I didn't, pretend like I did. We plant seed. We water seed. His job is to make the seed grow. If you find yourself in a position where you ever get frustrated, it's because you're trying to take on his job. It's his job to make it grow. All we do is plant seed and water it. We got to get out of the business of trying to fix people. Maybe you're saying to yourself right now, well, pastor, I don't know if I could be in relationship with somebody who lives a life of sin. I don't know if I can pull that off. But that's unfortunate. Because a sign of spiritual maturity is knowing that you can love the sinner without loving the sin. I can love the sinner without loving the sin. The problem is so many of us in the Christian community, we've turned our backs on people because they live in sin. Oh, how we forget that we ourselves at one point in time, we're living the same life they're living. Well, Pastor, I've been walking with the Lord my whole life. I never had those issues. You had some things happen in your life that if people knew about them. Okay? I know you tell your kids, you've always been, I've always been on the straight and narrow. I've never made the mistakes you make. No, no, the reality is we all have some stuff that's a little embarrassing. It would be embarrassing if it came out. Right? We've got to learn to love the sinner and not love the sin. You've got to be able to separate the two. It's a sign of spiritual maturity. Are you with me? The question, or the thing I want you to think about is this. If everybody in your life already knew Jesus, if everybody in your life had no sin in their life, how in the world would you be able to live out the Great Commission? Like, There would be no way you could fulfill the Great Commission if everybody in your life already knew Jesus, which is one of the reasons why I don't completely understand why we as Christians have a tendency to panic when we see the world going down the wrong path. Because as the world goes down the wrong path, that just means the altar is going to get more and more full. It's job security for us. And when I say us, I don't mean just me. It's all of us because we all have the same role. We're all called to reach the lost and as people some people are like well pastor how do you deal with you know like when people don't want to have anything to do with Jesus how do you deal with that it don't bother me at all because first and foremost when they reject him they're actually they're not rejecting me they're they're rejecting him number one but then number two I literally walk away from people and what I say in my mind is I'll see you at the altar really soon Because those same people that turn their back on Jesus are going to be brought to their knees at some point. And they're going to end up right here with snot and tears. I've seen it happen over and over and over and over again. We've got to love people as they are. Love the quote, we should try to reach people where they are today and expect to see changes later. Here's another important one. Don't judge them. Don't judge them. If we're going to build relationships with lost people, we cannot judge them. Look at John chapter 8, verse number 4. Let me give you some context. There's a woman who has been been caught in adultery. At the time, Jewish law said that if a woman was caught in adultery, she could be stoned to death in public. So here these men are getting ready to stone her, and they pull Jesus aside. And this is what happens. It says, verse 4, and, and I think that the word it might be wrong, in it, wrong on that. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say, Jesus? Verse number 6 They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. But Jesus stooped down and he wrote in the dust with his finger. I love Jesus because he was so, he was so like, I got this under control. I ain't even worried about this stuff. He starts writing in the dirt with his finger. 
Verse 7, they kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and he said, all right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. In other words, Jesus says, all right, all right, all right, all right, all right. We can stone her to death. But let's just make sure that the person who throws the first stone is the one who has never sinned before. Y'all know how this is going to go. Verse number 9, when the, when the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, where did all your accusers go? Didn't even one of them condemn you? In other words, he was saying, I, I just thought they were just saying they were going to throw stones at you. Where would they go? Verse number 11, no, Lord, she said, and Jesus said, neither do I. Go and sin no more. Here's what I wanted to point out. Her sin was the last thing Jesus addressed. It wasn't the first. Her sin was the last thing that Jesus addressed. Now, I'm not saying that sin is not important. Sin should be addressed. I've talked to you all on many occasions, and I told you that sin is a thing that will rob us from everything that God intends for us to have in our life. However, Jesus did not mention her sin first. He mentioned it last, but how quickly are we as Christians, or do we as Christians, point out people's sin first? How quickly do we make that the priority? Oh, you're an adulterer? <laughs> You're gay? <laughs> oh, transgender. Woo! How quickly do we point out the person's sin first? Jesus pointed out last. I'm not saying it's not important. It is very important. But if we're going to reach people that are lost, people that are far from God, maybe our focus should be on getting them Jesus first. Because if we get them Jesus then the Holy Spirit will be the one that will change them and clean them up from the inside out. You want behavior to change? Get them Jesus. The behavior will change after they have Jesus. Are you with me? Amen. So we, got, we can't judge people. Look at Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Do not judge or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. I remember... Um, Going back to the prison, there was a, a gentleman at the prison who, we, he would always sit on the front row. Uh, he was a very, uh, he loved the Lord, very astute, very smart brother. And uh, it didn't matter how often I went in there to preach. He was there every single time. When we would do group time, he would always get the guys together and he would lead the group. He was really committed to helping guys who didn't know Jesus find them. And so I was having a conversation with him one time, and uh, I never asked the guys why they were locked up behind bars. Because I did not, I wanted to love them for who they were and not judge them based upon their worst mistake. Right? Come on, y'all. Like, like if, if people knew what your worst mistake was, like, come on, that, that would definitely be a game changer as far as their relationship with you. Right? I, I, didn't, I did not want to judge them for their worst mistake, so I never would ask so this brother came up to me one day, this guy I'm telling you about, and he starts telling me about where he came from. And he didn't come from too far from here. And so he starts telling me about his family, and he starts telling me about where he used to work. And he starts telling me about the things he liked to do, and so on and so forth. And eventually, all of the dots connected, and I realized that I knew who this guy was. You see, the crime that he committed was on the news for months before he ever got sentenced and put behind bars. And so here he was telling me, man, I'm so excited because, man, I'm about to get out of here in two years. And immediately I began to judge. I was like, this, now I didn't say that on the outside. On the outside, I was like, yeah, this is great. This is great. But on the inside, I was like, you getting out of here in two years? No, 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 no. I'm calling the judge tonight. Absolutely not. You of all people should not be out, out, of, out of prison. You need to be locked up underneath the jail, you know? I went into judgment mode really quickly. I mean, it was, it changed everything. It changed how I responded to him. I didn't want to have anything to do with him. I began to look at him as disgusting. I began to look at him as less than a human being. 
Now, mind you, everybody that's in prison, not everybody in prison is guilty. All right, let me just be clear on that. Not everybody in prison is guilty. But assuming he was guilty, man, it made it so easy mentally for me to begin to judge him by his crime. Make a long story short, God reminded me of the passage of Scripture we just read in Matthew chapter 7. Let's look at it again. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Now, some of you all are, have been walking with the Lord long enough to know that the judgment that's being talked about can be seen in two ways. It can be seen as discernment, but it can also be looked at as con- a condemnation. I'm talking more so about the condemnation. I went into full-blown condemnation mode, and the Lord had to check me. And reminded me, who in the world are you to judge him? I I think we all have to get to a place where we recognize that there, but by the grace of God, we'd be him. But by the grace of God. We've got to stop judging people. I made a decision after that time. It took me about going in there like another two times. Before I got to a place where I was like, you know what? I'm going to love him as he is, not for who I think he should be. I'm going to love him as he is and not judge him based upon the worst mistake he's ever made. And we've got to be willing to do the same thing, especially if we're going to reach people that are lost for Jesus. Amen? Amen. Now, the last thing that I want to share My third point, I am serious. It's going to come across as I'm joking, and I kind of am, but I'm serious. Look at your neighbor tell him he's serious on this. He's serious, okay? (laughs) Point number three, don't be weird. If you're going to reach people that are far from Jesus, Christians, we got to stop being weird. Okay, let me give you some examples. God has given you the gift of speaking in tongues. So you go to the gas station, and you're in line at the gas station going in, speaking in tongues. You're going in. Who stole my Hyundai? You're going in, okay? Trust me, no one in the gas station is going to want to talk to you about your relationship with Jesus after they hear you going in, speaking in tongues. Stop being weird. I had a friend of mine, pastor. He didn't have a car. Caught the bus everywhere he went. And he said, man, I love, I love catching the bus. I'd rather not have a car. <laughs> he says, because what I do is I put on my robe. He didn't say this part, but this is what I noticed. He would wear his Jesus sandals. Y- y'all know what Jesus said? Y'all ever seen Jesus sandals before? He would wear his robe and his Jesus sandals. And he said, I go on the bus like this because I want to talk to people about Jesus. And I'm like, listen to me, brother, okay? There ain't many people that see you and say, let's talk about Jesus, okay? I know you look like Jesus right now, but just because you look like Jesus don't mean you're Christ-like, okay? Stop being weird. We got to stop being weird. Some of us as Christians, by the way, have you ever met a spooky Christian before? I just want to make sure we're all on the same page. If you never met a spooky Christian, you are the spooky Christian, okay? I'm just saying, okay? If you never met one, because it's a lot of them out there, okay? It's a lot. We got to stop being weird. Let me give you an example of some things that are, are weird. Some people in the body of Christ, you see the devil everywhere you go. Everywhere you go, you see the devil. Ooh, girl, there he go. There who go? Satan, girl, he underneath the tree over there. You see Satan underneath the tree. You, they ain't going to never want to hear anything about Jesus from you. You see Satan walking around? Stop being weird. Let me give you another example. You got some people who they see Satan in every situation. Like, oh, I done gained 30 pounds in the past month. Satan is really working on my body. Satan's not working on your body. That's the cake. Put the cake down. Stop being weird. Give you another example. I'm trying to help you, okay? I want you to reach as many people for Jesus as possible. You can't reach people for Jesus if you're weird, okay? Let me give you another example. 
Oh, every time I look at my bank account, there's a zero. I log out, I log back in, another zero. Look what Satan's doing to my bank account. Satan ain't doing that to your bank account. That's Amazon. Because you can't stay off of Amazon. Stop being weird. And we say things like this, and as Christians, we don't even think anything about it, but it says to people that are on the outside, something's different about those people, and I don't like it. They come across as a little, I don't know, weird. (laughs) Another thing that we all have a tendency to do, maybe this isn't weird, it's just is what it is. You know, we come into Christ and we develop a second language. Um, It's called Christianese, right? And so we go places as Christians and we speak a language that only Christians understand. (laughs) We'll say things like, somebody asks us, how you doing? I'm blessed and highly favored. People that are far from God are like, okay, I guess I am too. I don't know. Question mark? We'll say things like, uh, uh, um, you know, yesterday I was spending time in the closet. (laughs) Spending time in the closet doing quiet time. People that don't know God, when they hear that, they're like, you on punishment? Well, I don't understand. This is confusing. Christianese. It's a language that only Christians understand. Another example. So what we're going to do is we're just going to pray a hedge of protection. That's what we're going to do. We're going to pray a hedge of protection. They're like, when did we start talking about bushes? Hedges? I don't get this. I don't don't understand. Here's what ends up happening. Because you speak Christianese, you force people into one or two categories. Either they're going to pretend that they understand what you're saying, Or they're just going to never want to have a conversation with you ever again. Neither one is going to get you the outcome that you're looking for, right? We got to stop being weird. Come on, somebody. Some of y'all sound like your feelings got hurt here. I'm trying to help you out here. (laughs) Trying to help you out. And maybe maybe you say right now to yourself, maybe you say, well, um, I don't feel like I should have to change my language in order to reach people for Jesus. And I would say to you, that's okay. You don't have to change what you do, but you're just not going to live out the Great Commission. You're just not going to reach lost people. Because I've spent enough time with lost people to tell you that lost people find that stuff weird. I was one of them. And there was a long period of time where the people that I saw representing Jesus, I said, if that's Jesus, I don't want to have nothing to do with him. Look at what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 9, 22. Yes, I try everything. Put it up here, guys. Yes, I try everything. I'm sorry. I try to find common ground with everyone doing everything I can. If we're serious about reaching people that are far from God, we got to be willing to do everything. That means changing how we speak. That means knowing our audience. That means figuring out how, what's the best angle of approach. How can I become interested in what it is they're interested in? We've got to be willing to do everything. Or we can't honestly say that we're serious about living out the Great Commission. Amen? So that's the last point. we got to stop being weird. Okay. So we talked about what it means to reach out to those that are lost. We've talked about uh, how we now go about relating to people that are far from God. But I wanted to talk as we close today to the person who you're listening to this, and the first thing that comes to your mind is the negative, right? First thing that comes to your mind is, Pastor, what if I do everything that you say? I build a relationship with this person. I take an interest in what they're interested in. I'm intentional. I do all of this. And they make a decision that they don't want to know Jesus. Pastor, aren't you kind of like setting us up for failure? Aren't you setting me up to potentially reopen some rejection wounds that I have from childhood? Pastor, I, I don't know. I found something that Paul said pretty interesting. And it's what I wanted to close with today. You can go ahead, Artavis. It's what I wanted to close with today. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. And we're going to look at the end of verse number 22. I try to find common ground with everyone. 
doing everything I can to save some. Everybody say some. Now I want you to think about this for a minute. Paul, here he is, a great man of faith. Paul wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. And he says that I do everything I possibly can to reach some. Notice what he's not saying. He's not saying I do everything I possibly can so that I can reach all. Why? Because Paul recognizes that no matter how spirit-filled I am, no matter how much time I spend with the Lord, no matter how intentional I am in building relationship, relationships, there are going to be some people who are going to make a decision not to have anything do, to do with the Lord. And I can tell you the same is true for you. You can get out here and you can work really, really hard to build relationships, to connect with people that are lost. And no matter how hard you try, there are going to be some people that are going to make a decision not to have anything to do with God. And maybe for you, that's a reason to throw in the towel. Maybe for you, that's a reason to not even try. But I think about it like this. Jesus, when he called some of the disciples, he told them, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Now, if you know anything about fishing, you know that no matter how good of a fisherman you are, no matter if, whether you get the right bait, you pick the right lake, you pick the right pond, you pick the right part of the ocean, no matter how good you are, there's no way you're going to catch all the fish. But good fishermen don't go fishing on any given day to catch all the fish. They go fishing on any given day to catch some of the fish. Can I tell you something? We don't do it for the all. We do it for the some. The reality is, we don't know what fish are going to bite, but we still cast our rods. We don't know how many people are going to make the decision to follow Jesus, but that don't stop us from talking to the lady at the grocery store. That doesn't stop us from talking to the person at our job. That doesn't stop us from talking to the family member that's never wanted to have anything to do with the Lord. That doesn't stop us because we do it for the sum. Maybe You've been paralyzed by fear. And next week, I'm, I'm going to talk to you about how you go about actually sharing your faith with people now that we've gotten to that place. Maybe you've been paralyzed by fear. I, I want you to know, don't let anything stop you from fulfilling the Great Commission. Not even the fear that you might not catch everybody. Because it doesn't matter how good you are at this, you're not going to catch everybody.